U.S. is currently in the midst of a big election year. By the end of 2016, we'll have some new senators, representatives, legislators, city council members, dog catchers, and a new president. And some sign says women might be better suited than men to be in charge. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves. First, we all need to get on the same set of facts. According to a Norwegian study of 3,000 managers, a good leader has five characteristics. Number one, good leaders withstand the stress and pressure of the job and have a high degree of emotional stability. They take initiative, are clear, and communicate well. They're usually extroverts. Good leaders can innovate, are curious and ambitious, and are open to new experiences. Plus, a good leader is social and supports and includes everyone on their team. And finally, the best leaders can set goals, be thorough, and then follow up. So, according to this study, leaders are emotionally stable, extroverted, curious, supportive, and methodical. And according to their research, women were more likely to score highly on four of these five traits. Apparently, female leaders tend to worry a lot, making them a little more stressed. This is supported elsewhere, too. In a 2008 survey done by the Pew Research Center, 2,250 people were asked who they thought was more honest, women. intelligent, women. hardworking, Tie. ambitious, Tie. outgoing, women. creative, women. compassionate, women by a mile, and decisive. God, we finally got one. Men. If Trace and Lisette were together, I would say that their sex life would be composed of only anal, as she would definitely just ass fuck him with a strap on. Well, we're back to the topic of feminism, and I haven't discussed it in a while. I remember watching the 2004 movie Troy, and a feminist commented how men should not be in politics because they're too violent. Recently, I've seen that claim being echoed throughout certain groups, and I thought I'd uh, respond to that, because I myself was even surprised. Now, you can easily answer the question with uh, something I, I like, and that's called history. I would answer no. Women are not always better leaders than men, because historically, queens were more likely to start wars than kings. I'll give you a little history lesson. According to the National Bureau of Economics, between 1480 and 1913, queens were 27% more likely to start a war than kings. And I'm talking about attacking and starting a war, not like they were attacked and they had to defend their territory. This includes all parts of the world and not just Europe. Queen Hatshepsut is regarded as one of the first female pharaohs and the first great woman in history of whom we are informed of. People will say that she inaugurated a peaceful era and mostly ruled and expanded her empire through trade rather than war. But what they don't tell you is, is that early on in her reign, she started off multiple wars. She waged war against Nubia, which is in modern day Libya, and the Canaanites at the Battle of Megiddo. This was a battle for territorial positions and goods. So, as it seems, there really is no basis for the claim that she was any different from the other pharaohs of ancient Egypt. The African continent the continent has seen more warrior queens than our pharaoh here. Amina was a warrior queen of the city-state of Zazao in modern-day Nigeria in the mid-16th century. Shortly after she began her reign, she waged a 34-year-long campaign against her neighbors in order to expand Zazao territory. In fact, one of her first announcements was to call on her people to resharpen their weapons. Her reign ended in 1610 when she died. Asia has seen much female warmongers, such as Rani of Jhansi, which is now in northern India, and other examples include Zenobia from the Palmyran Empire, which is today Syria, and Keladi Chinamani from the kingdom of Karnataka, which is also in India. All three of them spent decades fighting wars against rival empires for control. Now, I know we're all thinking it, so let's just go to Europe. Queen Maria Theresa of the Austrian Empire used all her nation's cash to basically bolster her enemies and fight for the goal of conquest. Another example is Queen Isabella of Granada, uh, which is more famous for giving Christopher Columbus the means of exploration, but she also waged war against her neighbors, starting in 1482, which led to her conquering them and leading to the creation of the nation of Spain, which we know today. Catherine the Great from the Russian Empire is the second most famous Tsar after Peter the Great. She was described as ruthless and ambitious and did not waver when it came to her military campaigns. She came into power in a coup that overthrew her first husband in 1762, and until the end of her reign in 1796, she extended Russia's borders by some 520,000 square kilometers and fought against the Baltic states, Crimea, Belarus, the Ottoman Empire, Sweden, and many, many more. She even had rivalries with China and Japan, and even intensified the Russian colonization of Alaska 
Alaska, which saw wars against the natives of the region. She was widely known throughout Europe and was viewed as the figure which solidified Russia as a key world power at the time. Now, there are many, many examples of queens that started war, and I cannot give you a list of them all. You can actually look them up if you want. But you're probably asking, why? Why is this the case? Well, authors Oindrila Dube and S.P. Harish believe that all of this comes down to queen management style and how it is radically different from kings. The first clue comes from the fact that many married queens were quite bellicose and benefited more from marriage alliances. Married queens also frequently roped their husbands into helping them rule, something that kings hardly ever did with their wives. Another reason was because of the nature of society back then. It was a lot harder for a queen to find people to trust considering that in those days it was more of a male dominated society and so technically they were more open to purging campaigns such was the case of Queen Elizabeth the first sister who actually openly went out persecuting Protestants well, today most governments have a republic instead of a monarchy and war is decided and declared through a legislative body, it would be interesting to see if a female-dominated parliament has any correlation with its female monarch parliament. So, the next time a feminist calls you a misogynist, or in the case of my female subscribers, tells you that you have internalized misogyny, make sure to tell them they're a bunch of warmongers.